Welcome to this YSL Report Builder tutorial. In this part of the series, we'll explain how to use custom indicator icons. We'll start with a quick reminder of adding basic indicators to a table in a report, and then explain how to import images and assign those imported images to the indicators you've created. We'll also show you how you can upload images to a report server and then set your indicators to reference those uploaded images. So let's get started. Here's an idea of the type of thing we'll create in this video. This table shows a list of films along with the runtime in minutes, and the final column of the table has a basic graphical indicator to represent which band the runtime falls within. So the longer films get the grown-up adult owl image, the slightly shorter films get a baby owl, and we go further and further backwards until the shortest film gets a boring old egg. The images themselves, of course, have nothing whatsoever to do with the data we're representing. It's purely to demonstrate that you can use any images you like to replace the standard set of graphical indicators provided by Report Builder. If you would like to follow along, you'll need a copy of the YSL Movies database, and there's a video here that explains how to get that set up, with a link in the video description to download any files you'll need. You'll also need a set of images. I'm not going to provide those for you, but I'm sure you've got plenty of images on hand. I'm using PNG files, but you're welcome to use other image file types as well. Assuming you've got all that done, I'm going to head over to Report Builder, where I've got a blank report waiting for me, and get started by building the simple table. To get started, I'll create a data source to connect to the YSL Movies database. So I'll right-click on my data sources folder and choose Add Data Source. I'll call the data source Movies, and I'll use an embedded connection pointing to a Microsoft SQL Server. I'll then click the Build button to get some help with the connection string. I'll type in a shortcut to my local host, dot backslash, and then the name of the instance of SQL Server I'm using, which is SQL 2017. I can then select my Movies database from this drop-down list and then click OK a couple of times to create the data source. Next, I'll right-click on that data source and choose Add Dataset. I'll call the dataset Films, and then use the Query Designer to get some help with creating the select statement. I'm just going to pick a few columns from the Film table, so I'll expand the Tables folder first, followed by the Film table, and then select the Title, the Runtime Minutes, and the Oscar Wins. I'm going to use the Oscar wins column to filter the table of results. I only want to see films with at least seven Oscars. This is just to limit the number of rows we see in the table, just to make it slightly easier to demonstrate the, uh, the indicators that are appearing. So I'm going to add a basic filter by clicking the Add Filter button, change the field name to say Oscar wins, and then say is more than or equal to, and type in the number seven. Having done that, I can click OK. While I'm here, I'd like to sort the results so that the longest film appears at the top of the list. So I'm just going to copy the Film Runtime Minutes field, and then click at the end of the select statement, after the WHERE clause, and add in an ORDER BY clause. I can then paste in the name of the field I've just copied, and then say DESC, so that the results are sorted in descending order of runtime minutes. So having done all that, I can click OK, and there's my data source and data set created. Next, we can add a basic table to display the results of that data set. I'll start by tidying up my report by removing the page footer first of all, and then getting rid of the title text box at the top. I can then right click into the report and choose Insert Table, and then I'll assign the three fields, Title, Oscar Wins, and then Runtime Minutes. I'll drag the table up to the top left-hand corner of the page and then just change the column width for the title column. And then just to make sure I don't encounter this font rendering bug where often all the details of the table don't get displayed when you run the report. You may well have encountered this yourself the first time you run it. The table is, in this case, completely empty. And to solve that, I can highlight all of the cells in the table, change from the default font to any other, and then back to the default font, and that will sort out that part. I'll just apply some very basic formatting to the header row as well, just to make that stand out. So I'll just apply a basic background colour and make the font bold, and then just briefly change the column header for the runtime column so that it says runtime rather than runtime minutes. So at that point, if I run the report, there's the basic table created. Next, we can add a new column to the table to hold the indicator that will display the value of the runtime minutes. Let's head back to the design view, and I can right-click into any cell in the runtime column, choose Insert Column to the right. I can then right-click on the cell in the Details row or the Data row of the table, and then choose to Insert an Indicator. 
And at this point, I have to start by selecting one of the built-in icon sets. I'm going to go with any icon set that has five different bands in it. So here's a simple one to use, these five gray arrows. If I select that and then click OK, that's enough to create the basic indicator that we can then modify. I'll also, of course, need to assign that indicator to a field. If I run the report at this stage, there's no indicator displayed because we haven't chosen what value it should be indicating yet. So back in the design view, I can select the cell that I've just inserted the indicator into and then click once again on the icon to make the gauge data panel appear. And then from this drop down list where it says unspecified, I can select the value for the runtime minutes field. That will set itself to be the sum of runtime minutes but the sum is calculated for the scope in which the indicator sits. And the scope for this indicator is a single detail row. So the sum of runtime minutes is just the same as the value of the runtime minutes for that particular row. So if I run the report at this stage, we'll see the different icons have been created according to the choices we made earlier. Before I start assigning my own custom images to these indicators, it's helpful to import the images you're going to use into the report first. So to do that, I'm going to head back to the design view and I'm going to right click on the images folder in the report data window and choose add image. Now I'm already pointing to the images folder that I've got my wise owl pictures stored in, but these files aren't appearing yet because this dialog box is filtered to show only JPEG files by default. You can click on the drop down arrow there and choose from a range of other image file types or just choose all files to see everything in that folder. So annoyingly, you have to do this one by one. I can't select more than one file at a time. So I'm going to double click on the owl one egg file and import that. And then I can just carry on right clicking and choosing add image, annoyingly having to change the filter each time to import the next one. So I'll carry on doing that off screen so that we can get on with the next part a little more quickly. So I have my five images imported into the report now. I can assign them to the indicator itself by right clicking on the indicator and choosing to view the indicator properties dialog box. I can then head onto the value and states page and then for each icon displayed in this list, I can change the image used by clicking on the drop down arrow and choosing image. I then have a further couple of choices to make. First of all, the source for the image. This particular example is not an external image. We've just imported it into the report itself. So we're going to choose to use an embedded image. And then we can simply choose from the drop down list any of the five images we've imported. So this one's going to be owl one egg. So that will go for the, uh, the lowest band, anything within the first 20% of values. I can then continue to do that for each of the other uh, icons. So I can click the drop down arrow and choose image make sure that it's an imported or embedded image and then choose the next image in the sequence. And again, this is a little bit tedious at this point. So I'm just going to do this off camera and we'll skip ahead to the next stage once I've done that. So I have all five images assigned to the five icons that were previously being used for this set of indicators. And having done that, I can click OK and you should see that an image has now appeared in the cell. You may notice a small problem with that as well. But just to prove that we are getting our different images displayed next to our different values for the runtime minutes, let's run the report and just see what it looks like. It will be fairly hideous, but you can clearly see we're getting different images for each of the five bands. The obvious problem with this, of course, is that the images are completely distorted by the size of the cell that they belong to. There's a quick, simple solution to solve this problem. Let's head back to the design view and I can click on the cell containing the image and then click once again on the image itself to select the indicator. So you can see that I've got indicator one selected at the top of the properties window. If you can't see the properties window, by the way, head over to the view menu and choose to display properties by checking that box. What we can do with the resize mode property is change this so that it doesn't auto fit. It will use none. And that will mean that the image will appear at its regular size. So if I choose to run the report at that point, we can see we've got a, a further problem, but it's a little bit better than it was before. It's certainly not distorted. So because the image is appearing at its regular size now, what we need to do is change the height of the rows so that we can see the entire image. This is a little bit of trial and error. So if I click into the cell containing the title and then just use the handle on the left hand side to increase the height of the cell. If I then run the report, 
we should hopefully find that we can see the entire image reasonably clearly without any distortion. If you'd like to use the same set of images in multiple different reports, and let's face it, who wouldn't want to use this set of owl images in lots and lots of reports? But it can be quite tedious if you have to import those images every time you create a new report. So as an alternative, you can also reference images that are deployed to your report server. If I head over to the homepage of my report server in the Reporting Services web portal, I've created a folder here called Images. I did that just by clicking on the New tool and choosing to create a new folder. And I've already imported the first four images into that folder, so I'll just upload the fifth and final image by clicking the Upload button and then choosing that OWL5 picture. So that's now included in this folder as well. When it finally refreshes, they will appear eventually. There we go. And having done that, I can head back to the design view of my report in Report Builder. And then I can select my image, right click on it and choose Indicator Properties. And then on the Value and States page, rather than using an embedded image for everything, I can change that to an external image. What I then need to do is browse for that image by clicking the Browse button to the right hand side. And I can browse to my report server and then the images folder in there and then select the image file just by double clicking on it. Then I can do the same thing for each of the subsequent images. So once again, changing embedded to external and then hitting the browse button and browsing to the server and choosing the images folder and choosing the second image. And once again, because this is such a tedious process, I'll do the rest off camera and then come back when we've finished. OK, so I've finished referencing the five different images using the external option and pointing to the image file deployed to the report server. So I can click OK at that point and it appears as though my icon has disappeared entirely. So in the design view, I don't see that image any longer. But when I run the report, we should be able to see that we retrieve the images from the report server. Finally, just to demonstrate that this still works when we save the report to the report server, let's head back to the design view and I'll head to the file menu and choose save as, and then I'll point to the report builder folder to save this file in. And I'll call this one custom indicator images. I'll save that report then. And then I'll head back to my report server in the reporting services web portal. I'll head back to the home page and then find my report builder folder and then find my custom indicator images report. So I'll click on that report to load it and we'll still see the same images now being retrieved from the uploaded files I showed you earlier. So there we are. That's the basics of using custom icons to replace the default indicators used in report builder. Hope you found that one useful. Thanks for watching. See you next time.